some clients are living with their family and it causes further um, social isolation. Um, some people have lost people, so it's very difficult. Um, some people, uh, the clients I work with, aren't really out. There's no point paying someone on a like £500 to talk about their story and, and the art project, but then leaving them. There's got to be, because there's got to be something that's much more, has longevity. So if you're working with an artist or a community, it's best not to use them just for pride. It's best to use them throughout the year. As a, a Sikh person, as Punjabi, um, uh, my parents are from India. I, did, I don't think I knew where to go to when I was younger. Who can I talk to about my sexuality? I bet I still couldn't go to anyone to talk about it for the, from fear. So that shouldn't really be happening in 2020. Dan, Dan Singh. I work at Birmingham LGBT, so I work in sexual health and well-being. Predominant work with South Asian, Middle Eastern MSM men, men that might uh, identify as gay or bisexual or are just questioning. Um, so it's around sexual health testing and one-to-one -one health and well-being support. Um, I also facilitate a South Asian, Middle Eastern men's group called Rung, which means colour in Hindi and Punjabi, and that runs twice a month at the moment on Zoom. In my personal life, I'm a, I do lots of visual arts in the Birmingham Mid Midlands, mainly live art performance, video, that sort of stuff, really. In the last six months, I think COVID has affected everyone, mainly their mental health and their physical well-being. Uh, for myself, um, I've kept myself busy with my two jobs. I've gone to lots of different creative Zooms. I've got on my artwork. Um, I've got on, a, got on with an art project with my mother, We're making a short documentary together. Um, so I've kept myself busy, um, but it does affect mental health and for the clients that I work with, um, that's definitely top on the agenda. Their mental health is affected, their physical well-being is affected. Some clients are living with their family and it causes further um, social isolation. Um, some people have lost people, so it's very difficult. Um, some people, uh, the clients I work with aren't really out, so that becomes another sort of um, a hurdle to cross. Uh, so they've been thankful for the one-to-ones -one provided. I mean, the impact has been quite quite great. Uh, I think amongst, specifically amongst the LGBT community. Um, so I think it's 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 been very hard. We've been talking about eating well, food, exercise. Um, Birmingham LGBT Centre is open uh, five days a week for phone calls. To people who call phone support, so support in terms of HIV testing and one-to-one -one support amongst the other services that the Birmingham LGBT offer. Uh, what, what the men that I'm working with are telling me and other, other people, it's just the fact that I've lost their social network, maybe they used to go to clubs or pubs before, maybe they used to go to the groups at the centre, all that's um, uh, not available at the moment for obvious reasons. So we're trying to engage um, our customers in a different way, like putting on a quiz or putting on different uh, e-cafes and stuff like that and different groups. Um, and that is helping, but I think it's been a long time since it started and I think it is affecting everyone's mental health and well-being. I think, I think for me, what's really needed is um, uh, conversations that can happen now on Zoom, for example, or MS Teams, because people can come on anonymously. So there's been digital prides at Digital Leicester, Paddy, Digital um, London, Birmingham. Um, I think... Pride hopefully will still happen next year. If it doesn't, then we have to make backup plans of what Pride could look like, not just digitally, but how can it work in a socially distanced way. So it's got to, it's got to, it's going to, it feels like to me, if, if the virus is still here, then we've got to look at community models of Pride. So I think moving forward, Pride should also be digital. Um, and hopefully lots of funders will be funding art projects that are digitally engaged. Uh, that can happen uh, as well as physical pride. So that's just a standard that should be happening now. So I think places where people have got a reputation of putting art projects on um, 
should definitely be happening amongst uh, more disenfranchised people that might be BAME. So the people people running projects for their own communities will be quite useful um, and led by their own communities so it's person-centred. So I think in the future, Pride will should continue. And if it continues in the physical domain, it should also appear in, in a digital domain because not everyone wants to go out and drink, for example. And what opportunities are we giving people? It's no point paying someone on a like, £500 to talk about their story and, and the art project, but then leaving them. There's got to be, because there's got to be something that's much more, has longevity. So if you're working with an artist or a community, it's best not to use them just for pride. It's best to use them throughout the year. You know, and, and check in on them, how they're doing three months later, how are, they, how are they doing six months later, and often people forget that. So I'm very careful in what projects I get involved in, because um, I think it needs much more longevity than that. Because people often say, oh, they're hard to reach people. I don't think anyone's hard to reach. It's just about working out solutions that work better. So when we're creating like campaigns and stuff, sometimes it's best if they come from the communities. Otherwise, we're telling the communities this is what we found from research. I think it's better if they come from the community. And the only way change is going to happen, and it's happening, is for projects to happen from within the community. So sort of outreach needs to happen in a way that, in a physical sense, but in a digital sense, maybe what, what, do, what do people want? And, and if the survey is making specific for certain communities possibly, so they can actually really feel that they want to fill them in. Because when you do surveys to LGBT communities, you're mainly going to get 10% of people that uh, I'll be AME that filling them in if that and also this reliance on social media is quite interesting because people think well that's how people are, 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 are learning stuff not necessarily sometimes it just requires maybe a discussion in a small group in a park um, or in a community or in a market stall so it's about conversations because people don't want to be seen or be visible um, so I think be other creative ways of doing this rather than relying everything on social media because it's great as it is it's not for everybody i think the gap is that we we need to work out ways um for to have this conversation with community leaders and um uh, to to look at what the the uh the governance is of the board what the mission statement values are and then and then align with that and maybe speak to them and, and reach out but when you do try this it's difficult so i think community leaders have a responsibility to also engage in these conversations and 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 just listen to what may be happening to their children or their young adults or whatever. And also in this society, I think we disregard older people because older people to me have experience and they're more creative than people that are younger because they have all this learnt, uh, learnt experience. So we shouldn't in this, in this society dismiss older people as a, as a uh, a Sikh person, Punjabi, um, uh, my parents are from India. I don't, I don't think I knew where to go to when I joined, but who could I talk to about my sexuality? I bet I still couldn't go to anyone to talk about it for the, from fear. So that shouldn't really be happening in 2020. You know, I was born in 1970, that's 50 years ago. I think the anonymity of a Zoom allows parents to go on to listen. I mean, in the LGBT Sarbats group, we've had par parents on. Um, that and allies on that are talking and listening and asking questions. So people want to learn more because they want to support the children. And one thing I would say is that what parents do, I think, they have children, they want to live their lives, their dreams through their children. I don't think that should happen. I don't think children should, they should have seen the children's gender sex, or sexuality uh, when they're growing up. And I think they have these ideas that they'll do this, they'll go to college, they'll go to university, they'll get married. And I think, in my experience, uh, in my family, people are realising that actually if people want to have a love marriage, that's fine. If they want to meet someone from a different um, uh, culture, that's fine. But within my own South Asian culture, there's still a lot of colourism that goes on in, in quite a few cultures. So, I don't know, black, uh, uh, people of colour want to go lighter, white people want to go darker. So it makes me laugh sort of thing um, that, that black can't be beautiful and, and being fair is more beautiful which is what we're brought up with, and that's not true. Um, so breaking down these, these um, stereotypes as far as possible and realising that being, for me, being, being gay, my sexuality is a part of who I am. There's more to me. I said to my mum the other day, I said, Mum, why didn't you teach me how to cook? She goes, Punjabi boys don't uh, need to cook, they just need to sit down and we cook for them. I said, Mum, sit down. So I made a, a Sunday roast. I said, Mum, I'm going to cook for you every week now so you don't need to come and wash up. But she couldn't help herself and come to the kitchen trying to help out, which is fine.
So the point being is that I think she that she then realised she goes, you know what, I should have taught you how to cook. She enjoyed the food, but she was saying that it's important that I think this idea of boys and girls should be really much more fluid. I think it shouldn't be designated roles that you can do this and you can't do this. Everyone should be able to do everything they wish to do. For me, pride is, has it means a moment to be proud of who you are, a chance to be visible. Um, I think the most important thing about Pride is definitely um, the parade. I think that's quite a big moment for people to show the diversity of who we are as people. Um, and I think that that can be quite a proud moment for me. I feel Pride maybe feels a bit commercial at times. However, within Pride, there's lots of diversity of different sort of community groups meeting up. So I think Pride for, for me is still very important. And we, we, we need to continue having pride because it also is a symbol of hope and what's happening around the world because there's not equality everywhere. And even the UK, even though there's supposed to be equality, there's not really. We still get lots of homophobia, biphobia, transphobia. So I think it's, it's something that should just... I'm just glad it happens in the UK and I think it's... Uh, I'm proud because people, like for example, always come to the different stores, ask questions, there's a lot of drinking going on in Pride that, that happens and they've got lots of really good pop acts that happen. Some people don't particularly like Pride because it's too commercial. I'm kind of, I like parts of Pride and I like being involved in Pride and helping out. Um, and I think it's really important.